Hello everybody and welcome to this new episode of Tech Pizza, the podcast, video series and newsletter where we try to make tech more democratic and more fun, exactly like pizza. This week we had our first guest post. I invited a crypto expert to talk about the value of Bitcoin. And the reason why I did that is because you guys know that I'm a little bit of a crypto skeptic. So I know that I have a bias. I know that when I talk about crypto, I talk it through my lenses. And I wanted to give you a different perspective so that you can have a broader view of the crazy world of cryptocurrencies. If you haven't read that, go on tech.pizza and you're going to see the blog post in the recent editions tab. That said, let's get started because there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about today, as usual. The crypto bank Celsius filed for bankruptcy. It owes its customers $4.6 billion, but it just has a little bit more than 140 million in cash. This happened even though last year at its peak, it was managing more than $25 billion. And some people are calling it the Goldman Sachs moment of crypto. And that's because based on the rules of Celsius, they apparently don't have to give back money to their customers. The funds that people deposited on Celsius are the company's property. And so, mm, a lot of people probably are never going to see their money back. Let's try to understand what is Celsius, what is its business and how we got there. Celsius is basically like a bank. You can deposit your money in Celsius and you earn interest on the money that you deposit. And that's because they take this money and they lend it out to other people at a higher interest rate so that they make money out of the difference between the two. Some days ago, Celsius stopped withdrawals, which made people think that they were insolvent and they were actually were. And during that time, the interest rate that they were giving people was as high as 80 percent. Now, one of the reasons why the company is in such deep trouble is that to get this high interest rate, they basically told people that they will get this interest back in Celsius, the currency that they created. And they, seems like, were pumping this currency up. They were buying it themselves so that the value will be very high and then people got interest in a currency that they controlled, basically. And the other reason that really pushed them down the hole is that when the crypto market started to go down, Celsius needed needed to generate more returns, they needed to generate more money. And the way that they did that, or they tried to do that, is by starting to invest in more risky projects. For instance, Celsius lost a lot of money during the Terra breakdown that we discussed a few months ago. Now, a few more things about Celsius. First of all, they were marketing themselves as the alternative to the traditional banks. And the CEO of the company said publicly, we are safer than most banks because I I actually, I don't understand why they're safer than all the banks, considering that banks have regulations to make people safe and Celsius did not. So they did whatever they wanted. So yeah, that's kind of a weird claim. But the thing that actually pisses me off and should piss you off as well is that it seems like the managers of Celsius, the board of directors, the executives, they started selling their Celsius tokens some months ago. So it seems like while they were telling people, hey, stay with us, we're the safest alternative to banks, they were liquidating their assets because they knew that the crash was coming, which is pretty bad. And I want to close this news with some little thoughts. Crypto is not inherently good or bad, but a lot of people do bad stuff with it and the easiest way probably to protect yourself is to think that if something sounds too good to be true like an 18 percent interest rate it's probably not true it seems like we just recorded the biggest hack ever. Data about 1 billion Chinese people has been released on the internet, hacked from a police database. This data includes a lot of very sensitive information. Names, surnames, phone numbers, addresses, phone calls to the police and police reports. That's actually the scary stuff because you can know about all sorts of violations that people did. Anything from rape and child abuse up to people who used a VPN to access Twitter, which is illegal in China, and so the police has reports on these people. It's crazy, right? But it's even crazier how this happened. It was so easy. Somebody in the company that was managing this data created a backdoor link, which is one of these crazy links where you have a lot of seemingly random letters that you can create, let's say, when you want to share a document to Google Drive. And you send it to your friends, right? And anybody can access these links if they know the link. And so somebody in that company thought that it was going to be super helpful to have one of these crazy links to share with other co-workers, and it was going to be super easy to collaborate on this data. But then somebody in the open internet found this link and downloaded the data and put it for sale now for 10 bitcoins. It's 25 terabytes of data about Chinese citizens. One thing I want to say about this is that, as usual, with cybersecurity, the biggest threat is humans, is people making mistakes and forgetting to close a backdoor link or stuff like that. Then 
makes real threats to people. Imagine what you can do with this data. You could potentially threaten people and say, hey, I know that you have a child abuse lawsuit or report to the police. Give me this amount of money or I'm going to tell your boss. Something like that. There's a lot of different ways that you can use this data to hurt people. And it's a billion people for the mistake of probably one person. The problem is once the genie is out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. Once data is public, somebody saves it on a hard drive and it's going to be on the internet forever. <laughs> 60 self-driving cars crashed all at the same time in San Francisco. This is not a, like a physical crash, not like two cars hitting each other, it's a software crash. Basically, their software stopped working and it just stopped in the middle of the street. Blocking some streets also for ambulances and police cars, it was pretty dangerous. This happened to the self-driving car company Cruise, which is a company we covered already in Tech Pizza, because it's probably the company that seems to be more far ahead in the self-driving business. They have a license to have completely unmanned rides in San Francisco and people can pay for or a self-driving cab, which is pretty cool. What happened in this case is that it seems like their fleet stopped communicating with the servers. They kind of lost connection, let's say. And this means that they couldn't communicate with the cars anymore, even remotely, because they have a system where people can just like, like a video game, drive their cars from far away. They couldn't do that. So people had to physically go there and remove the cars. They have been blocking the street for up to 90 minutes. A few things to say about this case. We tend to think that self-driving means just having cars that drive themselves without killing other people, which it's a big part of it, of course, but there's a whole ecosystem to think about. There's server connections, there's error handling, what happens if a car suddenly doesn't work anymore, there's bugs, software bugs, there's, you know, all these different things. And we haven't even solved the main problem, which is making cars drive themselves. Cruise is pretty far ahead, but it's not 100% solved, I think. That's why they can drive just in San Francisco. There's going to be a trillion other problems coming along. And I'm not even talking about the regulatory issues that they're going to have to face. So I think we're still a long way ahead. I can't wait to sleep in a car while I'm moving around, but I guess I have to wait even more time. Facebook released a new AI translation model called NLLB, which stands for No Language Left Behind. It's a new language that is able to translate 200 languages, and it has extremely high accuracy in all these languages, much better than all the models that already exist. Facebook open sourced it, so any researcher can download the model or can download even the crazy training data that they used, which is pretty amazing. So let's try to understand why they did that. The first reason is democratization and try to expand the number of languages that can be translated by AI. To give you an example, in Africa, just 25 African languages were possible to translate into English with AI models. This new Facebook model can translate 55 African languages, so more than twice as much. There's also another interesting data point about the impact that this can have. Think about this. 10 million people speak Swedish and there are 2.5 million Wikipedia pages in Swedish. But let's take now another language spoken in Africa. Lingala is a language spoken in Congo, in the Central African Republic and in South Sudan, spoken by 45 million people, but it has just 3,000 pages on Wikipedia in this language, which gives you an idea of how poorly represented these languages are on the internet. And now Facebook partnered up with Wikipedia so that they can translate these languages. The second reason why this can help is for law enforcement and to try to limit the spread of misinformation. Imagine all the crazy stuff that can happen on Facebook from child trafficking to all sort of stuff. You know, I don't want to even make a list. Well, a lot of these things happen in languages that are not English and the fact that Facebook can now use AI to translate them and detect all these violations, it's going to greatly help them. And the third reason is, of course, the metaverse. Facebook says that the metaverse is going to be, of course, the next big thing. And so enabling people to communicate in their native language through AI translation in the metaverse, they think it's going to be a big feature. Let's quickly cover why this is technically amazing. I would say two main reasons. The first one is data. Obviously, for these very niche languages, there's not a lot of data available and AI needs data today. So Facebook was able, first of all, to gather more data, but then also to make these models very efficient to learn from little small training sets. The second amazing thing is that this is a single AI model that translates to 100 languages. Traditionally, if you want to make a big, nice, effective AI model, you will have to train one model for each language. Or well, Facebook managed to train one model for 200, which obviously makes it much easier to train, much easier to deploy it because it's a single model. So good job, Facebook, which by the way, it's called Meta. So good job, Meta. I, I still can't remember that. <laughs> Thank you.
You've probably seen all over the internet these amazing pictures of space taken from the James Webb Telescope. It's this amazing new telescope that has been deployed by NASA and a bunch of countries that actually all collaborated with NASA, which seems to be taking all the credit, but this was an international project. And now we can see them. And since a lot of people already talked about the beauty of the universe, I want to tell you something different that not a lot of people talk about, which is why is this James Webb telescope so amazing? The reason why it's in the Doppler effect. It's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. <laughs> oh, sure, I see it now, the Doppler effect. You may have heard about the Doppler effect in the case of sound. So, you know, when you have an ambulance that is running past you, you hear that the pitch changes. It goes from something very high to something very low. Something like this. <coughs> now, the same thing happens to light. When you have an object that is moving away from you very fast, the light that it emits changes. The if an object is coming towards you, the light becomes more blue. If the object is going away from you, the light becomes more red. Now, obviously, we don't notice this phenomenon at low speeds, but at high speeds, it really matters. And it turns out that the universe is expanding, which means that objects far away from us are moving away from us very fast. And so the light that they are pushing towards us becomes always more and more red. So red that it gets into the infrared. So a kind of red that our eyes cannot see, but the James Webb telescope can. And this is a big technical challenge to be able to catch this kind of light that was solved with the James Webb telescope. So here you go. I think now you have a cool fact to tell people over dinner. Isn't it cool? It's pretty amazing, right? <laughs> Thank you for watching this episode of Tech Pizza. Remember that if you want to get these videos and read them text and more in your inbox, you can subscribe on tech.pizza. I'm going to see you in your inbox or on videos or whatever you like to follow tech news. See you next week.